And our next guest, Elaine Valorio, in a Huffington Post article, proudly came out as black. The public declaration ended years of identifying only as Hispanic, but today she identifies as black as well as Hispanic, and she joins us live via Skype from her northern New Jersey home. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon to you. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Also part of the conversation is Janetta Condelario. Janetta Condelario is a sociologist and author of Black Behind the Ears, Dominican Identity, from museums to beauty shops. And Elaine, I'm going to get to you in just a moment, but first I just want to talk to Janetta uh, for, for, for just a second. Uh, Janetta, can you talk a little bit about uh, this phenomenon that you've obviously been studying for, for, for quite some time? You, you call it a, a paradox, if you will, that Dominicans often face when it comes to choosing Choosing their identity, either black or Hispanic. Where is the conflict? Um, I don't, I wouldn't actually agree that there is a conflict. I think that the question needs to be asked in terms of, well, where, where is the Dominican person you're asking standing? Are they in the United States or are they in the Dominican Republic? Are they in Italy? Are they in Spain? Uh, because context really does matter. And even within the U.S., New York is very different from Washington, D.C., from Texas, from California, in terms of, again, the context and what those questions will mean in that setting. So um, we have a lot of evidence and research that shows that uh, the either-or question really is as much about the person asking as it is about the person being asked. And that is really interesting. And so, Elaine, I, I ask you, what made you decide to self-describe yourself at one point as Latina and a few months ago describe yourself as black? Uh, well, it was like what Ms. Candelario said. Um, it stemmed from the fact that people kept asking me. Um, so when I came here uh, when I was six years old from Dominican Republic, I had never gotten the question, you know, what are you? Um, and then when I came here and um, I started taking classes with, you know, the rest of the kids who grew up here, um, you know, I, they were confused because they saw me speaking Spanish. And then they're like, well, well, you know, I thought you were black. I didn't think you were Hispanic. So for them, that was um, two totally separate things. And I thought, you know, from an early age that identifying as black, um, you know, would separate me from identifying as Hispanic. And I thought that that would be like um, sort of shunning my Hispanic culture. Um, and then as I grew older and, you know, I saw um, some of the stereotypes that, you know, Hispanic people and people who, you know, who have obvious Afro descent, um, but, you know, who still adhere to the stereotypes of blacks in this country. Um, like, for example, there's a saying in Dominican Republic, um, which I always, you know, like to talk about, which I've heard many times used is, you know, stop being such a Haitian. And wow. You know, Haiti and Dominican Republic in the past obviously have had a very um, rocky relationship, and blackness has always been associated with primitiveness and and um, just barbarity. So when people, you know, asked me and, and kept asking me, kept asking me, and I kept seeing, you know, well, you know, I look like, you know, other, you know, black persons here in the United States, um, but I don't identify as such. You know, why don't I do that? So I started to just, you know, identify myself as black, um, especially when I stopped uh, chemically straightening my hair. And, and Janetta, uh, the story that we're hearing from Elaine, do you hear that echoed quite a bit in, in your research and in your studies? Yeah, and again, I think that what you hear Elaine saying is that it's the either-or choice, and it emanates from the U.S., and that's the case both for Dominicans in the U.S., but also for Dominicans in the Dominican Republic. And one of the things that I uh, really wanted to understand in my research was what, what is that about? And the Haiti-Dominican-U.S. connection really is critical. I mean, it, in my book, I, I try to show that it really is the presence of the United States with its particular and actually very unique um, idea and ideology about race, and in particular about whiteness being a pure, exclusive category that cannot brook any kind of intermixture, otherwise it's tainted, um, and that blackness is the kind of catch-all category. Any, any mixture with blackness, the one drop of blood rule, which emanates from the United States, um, then you are black, you're automatically outside of the white category. Um, that very much was part of U.S. foreign policy in terms of its imperialism and intervention in Haiti and the Dominican Republic from the 19th century, because as you probably know, Haiti was the first um, independent republic in the Americas after the United States. 
So we have, you know, the U.S. establishing the lovely white republic, as Ben Franklin called it, and you have Haiti, not very long after, establishing the black republic. But the key difference is that the U.S. established the white republic as a slave-holding republic, right, that would grow, in fact, dramatically the number of people from West Africa that it would enslave after U.S. independence, right? So you have the largest number of, of enslaved uh, Africans being brought about 30 years after the U.S. independence of 1776 um, with the rise of the contingent, whereas Haiti gets established as a black republic um, as a purely abolitionist republic. No slavery, no holding people as chattel and property. So you have these two diametrically opposed visions of, of uh, citizenship and republicanism and personhood operating in the same hemisphere. Um, and when Haiti then unifies the entire island, which includes the former Spanish part of Santo Domingo, which is what later becomes the Dominican Republic, it does so with that vision, right, of black sovereignty, black citizenship. And it's the U.S. in its intervention, along with the former slave masters of the Spanish part, that begin to put forward this idea that you have to be either black or Hispanic. You one one or the, the other. And, and Janetta, I think some might would, I think some would argue, and, and, and Rupa, please weigh in on sure. this, that this is probably something that faces minority groups from uh, any country immigrating to the U.S. I mean, my family is from Jamaica, and one of the things that I'm often asked is, what are you? And if I say I'm African American, that in some way denies my Jamaican roots. Exactly. It's this either or situation that we're hearing. Absolutely. And I think we can even take this back, for example, to the earlier discussion we had about Princess Diana and Prince William being uh, partially of Indian blood. Fascinatingly, this only comes to light recently when, of course, people are that the world has changed, but, but back in 1790, when Princess Diana's ancestor of Indian blood, um, you know, was born, uh, she, they, they needed to hide her ancestry and uh, hide the fact that she was of Indian blood, but in, and so they, they said that she was Armenian which was apparently more acceptable. Yeah, exotic, but acceptable. Right, right exactly. And, and uh, Elaine, I do, ha I do have to ask you, though, what kind of uh, reaction did you get from, say, your family or your friends? Did they see uh, you now identifying yourself as, as black as some sort of rejection of them? No, uh, my friends have been uh, very supportive. And, you know, they were, you know, they were one of the first people that have asked me, you know, you know what, that, what are you question? Um, and when I explained to them, you know, that, you know, like Ms. Candelario was talking about that either or, you know, that I had to see, I had felt like I had to choose, but really I was both, um, you know, they got it. And they were like, yeah, you know, you're right. You can be both and you can identify as both. You know, there doesn't have to be a distinction. And then with my family, um, my parents um, were both Dominican born. So when my mom describes me, and she was actually describing me the other day to someone um, who didn't know me, she described me as, um, as India. And I read Ms. Candelario's book, um, so I thought that was interesting because India is usually, you know, and she talked about this, India is usually used to, you know, associate yourself with the, with the Tainos of the island. Um, for her, India, you know, was a perfect description of me, um, even though I would say that I have, you know, a bigger manifestation of African roots in me. Um, so for her, she still says, you know, no, but you're, you know, you're, you're India. I still see you as, as that. So it was someone else projecting onto you what they thought you were. And I understand yeah. that in your quote unquote coming out as black that you decided to wear your hair differently. You embraced uh, the natural pattern of your hair. You stopped yeah. straightening it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. Um, yeah, I actually, it was uh, in 2011. It was, it was the day before the first day of school of junior year. And I just, you know, I told my mom, you know, you know, I don't want to keep doing this. I kind of just, it was hurting um, just my hair texture. And I thought, you know, why do I have to be, why do I have to continue straining my hair? Why do, you know, I have to be ashamed of this texture. And my mom, um, her hair is very thick and very straight. Um, so at first she didn't get it, but she was very supportive. And after I stopped, you know, chemically straining my hair, that was when I was like, you know, I obviously have African roots in me. I mean, I could see that, you know, in my appearance and my hair texture and everything. You know, why do I keep saying I'm not black? because I'm obviously racially black. All I right. Elaine Valorio, thank you so much for sharing your story, Coming Out Black, as well as Janetta Candelario joining us uh, via uh, phone from Northampton, uh, Massachusetts. Again, thank you for your insight as well. We certainly do appreciate it.
Thank you. And you are watching Our Take.